you shall have three days after you receive this communication to you to depart with your families peaceably. If you do not depart, we will use the means in our power to cause you to depart. So help us God. David! It's either hiding or he's gone. said you were leaving. I didn't believe it. You can't truly believe that they'll hurt you. You read the letter. I read it. Those were Dr. Hayfard's words. Maybe. Let's go, girl. Welcome to our series about the witnesses of the Book of Mormon. My name is Cameron Bagley Fox, and we are joined today by Dr. Garrett Dirkmott. Garrett is an expert on early church history, and we are thrilled to have him with us today. I'm glad to be here. Garrett, can you tell me about the Danites? I know virtually nothing about them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, you know, that's actually probably what would be most people. I mean, it's something they might have heard of, but, you know, what exactly is it? So in Missouri in 1838, there is an increase in threats of violence against the Latter-day Saints. Now, violence to Latter-day Saints in Missouri is not a theoretical happenstance, right? They, they've already been violently driven out of Jackson County, and it makes pretty good political capital among Missouri legislators to, to be an anti-Mormon. I mean, there are politicians who run on the basis of, you know, and if you elect me, we'll make sure that there's no Mormons allowed to live in this county. And, and that's a popular position to take. So as it seems that there's a rising tide of these, you know, possible mobocratic threats, there is also this reaction to it that there are many members of the church that, frankly, they're, they're done with this. You know, we're American citizens. Why am I not allowed to fight back? Why are you allowed to come here with a gun and chase me out of my home? If you come here with a gun, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defend my home. There's a real frustration. Many of the members are being driven out of Kirtland now because of all the, all the difficulties there. But apparently there's a collection of Latter-day Saint men who decide that they are going to form up into a group to defend themselves against the mob if the mob comes. And even more so, to take proactive steps. If we know that this mob is over here burning down some houses, well, we're gonna go burn down some of their houses. We are going to fight fire with fire. What's unknown is the degree to which Joseph Smith is involved in its either creation or its methods. Now, those who are a part of it after the fact will of course all claim, oh yes, Joseph is the one who told me this. But Joseph himself, while he seems to know that there are people that are planning to try to defend themselves, he doesn't seem to know, or at least he writes to Emma and says, there were some things that were done, you know, under my name that I, I didn't know about or I didn't understand. Usually when it's talked about, and in the case of the witnesses, this idea that there's this kind of vigilante group of Latter-day Saints, militant Latter-day Saints, who are going to say, we aren't going to allow any mobbing here. Well, in previous places, dissent and, and apostasy had preceded mobocracy, right? I mean, look at what happened to Joseph and Sidney in Hiram, Ohio. You know, there are former members of the church leading that mob that's dragging them into the streets and, and tarring and feathering. Joseph! Sydney! 
And so the Danites are going to make threats against some of these apostates and dissenters in Far West, people like W.W. W. Phelps, people like John Whitmer and David Whitmer, and they are going to feel as if there's this not so subtle threat that's coming from these zealots inside the church that, that if you don't leave, we're gonna make you leave. And can you tell me about the Danite Manifesto? So this is a document that is later produced. It's something that is claimed to have been something that was drawn up with Joseph Smith's blessing. Now, Joseph Smith himself is saying that he isn't a part of it, so it actually becomes a kind of political football in that regard. Most of what we get of Joseph's involvement with the Danites and the Danite Manifesto actually comes from Samson Avard. So he is actually going to, in return for immunity, testify against Joseph Smith and against the other leaders of the church. And as you can see, that's a little bit of a complicated source because while he is someone who knows, because he's certainly a part of it, and by some accounts, the leader of the Danites, he's also giving his testimony in order to exonerate himself and to place the blame on someone else. So what do we know? We know that there were some Latter-day Saints who wanted to take vigilante measures to defend the church and its property and to drive dissenters out of their ranks because in their view, if you allowed someone to stay in your community who is saying, yeah, Joseph Smith's a false prophet, all that does is actually invite mobocratic action from the outside. The Danite Manifesto seems to factor far more prominently in our discussion of Joseph Smith today than than it it did did back then. I mean, certainly for the people that are dissenters in Missouri, they point to that as, see, this is proof that things went off the rails. But those dissenters had already left the church, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, W.W. Phelps isn't leaving the church over the Danite Manifesto. He's already left the church. Uh, John Whitmer's already been excommunicated. David Whitmer's already been excommunicated. So I I think it's important not to confuse, you know, something that exacerbates the tensions like the Danites and their manifesto with what causes those men to leave the church or to be excommunicated in the first place. They're Mm -hmm. actually separate things. For our purposes, the witnesses, they're already out of the church before you have this kind of tension building with the vigilante justice. But because they are some dissenters, Living in Caldwell County, they are the targets of that vigilante justice from Mm. the Danites. So the fear of being persecuted, is that a catalyst of having them leave? It certainly is going to make the ones living in Far West want to leave Far West, but they are already out of the church at the time that that fear. Because the reason why they have a fear is because they're not part of the church. Exactly. They are living inside of this, you know, church community but they have been excommunicated mm-hmm. and, and have spoken out publicly against Joseph Smith and against the church. In the excommunication hearings for people like David Whitmer, one of the claims that is made is that he is offering support to those other dissenters. Well, so, I mean, that, that kind of places dissent as part of the reason why he's excommunicated in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, and so you can see why someone might say, we've got to get him out of the community or he's going to invite these mob reprisals. Certainly, People like W.W. W. Phelps will say that they felt threatened by things like Sidney Rigdon's salt sermon and the formation of the Danites and the 4th of July sermon that, that is taking very militaristic rhetoric saying, we are going to fight if we have to. And the dissenters who want to undermine us, they better, they better uh, you know, get out of Dodge, so mm-hmm. to speak. So can you tell me more about the salt sermon? The salt sermon is a sermon that's given in June of 1838. We don't actually have a transcript of it, so I wish we did because it sounds like it was an amazing sermon. Yeah. Uh, it was given by Sidney Rigdon. And as we talked about, Sidney Rigdon is a powerful orator. Right. He has the ability to become quite carried away in his, in his sermonizing. He gives this sermon essentially trying to quell dissent. There's still a lot of dissent in early 1838, still stemming from the loss of Kirtland and the Kirtland Safety Society and the fact that other people have tried to set up their own churches that some people have claimed, well, David Whitmer should be the new leader of the church or that Warren Parish and his church should be the church. And so Sidney Rigdon's sermon likens these dissenters of these apostates to the sermon of, of Jesus, right? If, you know, ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the salt of the earth. Yeah. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Yeah. Have you lost your savor? then you are good for nothing but to be cast out and drawn in the foot of men. Cast them out. 
The implication, according to the, the people hearing it, is that Sidney Rigdon was saying, if you are an apostate, you are like the salt that's now worthless. And the only thing it's good for is to be cast out and trod under the... Well, that's not exactly a positive message right. if you happen to be one of those people that was excommunicated. And they certainly see that as a ratcheting up of, so you're, you're saying you're going to hurt me and my family if we stay here? And so it certainly is a ratcheting up of tensions in Missouri. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Joseph was dead. The young church balanced on a razor's edge. For grieving saints, there was no tested path, no definitive word on who should lead. But mere hours following Joseph's death, some began to campaign, while others looked for revelation from God. Be a part of the next chapter. Visit sixdaysinaugust.com.